In late December 2023 and throughout a good portion of this winter, I became fixated with bartending. More specifically, I was interested in the craft of preparing and serving drinks, despite my lack of interest in drinking alcohol myself apart from the occasional whiskey, reserved for a special occasion. I used to go to bars and watch sports games in the evening and night, well after graduating college with a philosophy and religious studies degree. Unrealistically sure of myself that I knew a whole lot more about the world than I did during high school, and yet, a little voice in my head was telling me, no, you don't know everything, you're as capable of ignorance as anyone on this planet. Anyway, bars were an escape for me from the stress and anxiety of working a 9 to 5, making it through every day of the week with little to no social interaction apart from some pedantic work project that needed to be completed on Excel, or maybe the occasional small talk with co-workers about an upcoming baseball or football game. Those nights out were spent watching the last innings of a Yankee matchup or maybe seeing a Rangers or Knicks game. Uh, this was when the Knicks, let's just say, weren't as good as they are now. But regardless, those nights were an escape from the mundanity of checking emails every five minutes or checking my desk phone to see who was calling. Of course, there was the small talk with the bartenders, checking in on the week and making sure I was satisfied, all while I was fascinated with how they mixed drinks, especially on nights where bars could get extremely crowded. Think, say, Super Bowl Sunday or the annual nightmare before Thanksgiving, aka Thanksgiving Eve, the most awkward high school hometown reunion you'll ever experience. And this being the bar, <sighs> say the words. Sometimes you wanna go where everybody knows your name. Especially given I would tip 20 to 25 percent since bartenders and waiters don't make nearly enough in a job where pay is pretty unsteady. However, and this is where my privileged ignorance showed its face again, despite my respect for bartenders, there was a part of me that said to myself, even with a measly desk job, thank goodness I'm not working at a place like a restaurant or bar, unaware and too ignorant of the many stresses and rewards that might come with such a job. Today, however, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has forced me to hunker down these last four years as someone who is high risk, not going to bars and restaurants on Fridays and on the weekends like I used to, as are the rest of the lot trying to navigate these days. Yet, somehow, despite these circumstances, throughout the last few years, I found that I was learning more about myself, both as a person and as a writer, with all the hiccups and writer's block I have had to deal with in writing and scripting video essays like this one. The bar that I go to now is the one I have in my apartment, aka my counter, and also one of my two workstations where I produce and edit videos, and of course play some video games. And yes, I do try to keep up with my sports in between creating essays like this. My counter bar is not exactly an ideal working space for professional video slash film production, and for meals and snacks while combating the reoccurring cycle and struggle of overcoming writer's block. Oh my writer's block! But hey, we all have to get by somehow by doing something which gives us even an inch of pleasure, even when the world seems to be against us. Whether it's COVID, the climate crisis, or the lack of a job, which lacks a living wage or even good benefits. Indeed, we should all take a portion of the day to enjoy the simple things in life and take a step back when things are going rough. Speaking of which, I can think of one scene from the television show Twin Peaks, one of my favorite shows of all time, and I'm sure some of you in the audience have seen seen this scene from the very first season when Special Agent Dale Cooper and Sheriff Truman stop by the Double R Diner, and despite Truman wanting to get out in a hurry for police work, Cooper delivers one of the show's finest monologues, and then the two of them enjoy the finest two cups of black coffee. While this scene is a brief pleasant moment during the show's original two-season run, this scene in particular has resonated with me for years since I first saw it, and the lesson I took from it is, regardless of how your day went, and what your mood was, you too should find the time to buy yourself a present, something you didn't plan ahead of time. Whether it's a hot cup of coffee, or in my case, enjoying a cold brew black coffee in a can glass, meant for beer as I write this, or maybe an hour or three of playing a video game. Because one thing I learned these last four stressful and draining years is that every day alive is a good day. Anyway, here's the part where the narrator finally gets to talking about one of his favorite gaming experiences of 2020.
Dave the Diver has the look of any video game with pixelated art these days, especially in the realm of indie gaming where you find games such as Celeste, Fez, or Hyper Light Drifter. Whether or not this is purely an aesthetic point, these games have capitalized on video game nostalgia while telling compelling and touching stories which are rarely told in the AAA market. And yeah, I just listed three well-received indie titles that share pixelated artwork with Dave the Diver, but we'll come back to this point of contention with the game in question today for a later chapter. From glossing over my YouTube search for trailer results in preparation before playing the game myself, I found that the most intimidating aspect of the game was just how long it would take to complete each of the game's chapters. One video in my search results struck me as I realized that I was going to have to sit down and play at least 34 hours of this thing. Jeez, then again, I spent hours and hours playing Zelda games and a especially Hollow Knight, and never once did I complain about the amount of time I was spending playing these games, but given that I was already used to playing other games which looked like a throwback to a previous time in my childhood, albeit with some impressive 3D art to combine with the pixelated graphics, Dave the Diver was either setting me up for a somewhat above average gaming experience, which I would forget within a month after completing, or this was going to be the biggest letdown for me in recent years. And let me tell you, man, after playing Dave the Diver for myself, man, I am so happy this game exceeded my expectations. Indeed, Dave the Diver is not only a fun time for any gamer looking to, to take a deep dive, pun intended, into a long but worthwhile comical action adventure, packing so much punch for a game that is worth only $19.99 on Steam, but this game offers a positive message that, when playing in the shoes of the main character, and going through the many, many days, afternoons, and nights diving and managing a restaurant, I think a lot of gamers miss out on the deeper meaning of Dave the Diver upon completing the game for the first time. That taking a step back to enjoy the simple little pleasures and things in life that make living for the moment all the worthwhile. And this is what makes Dave the Diver one of the most pleasurable, hilarious, rewarding, and deeper games in recent history. And all of its positive qualities is what I want to explore in this video essay. We will be exploring the game mechanics, the art of the game, the music, the deeper meaning of what it's trying to say, and of course, an analysis of our main character, Dave himself. So as always, with my video essays exploring video games, there will be major spoilers for Dave the Diver, as this video essay assumes you have had at least one playthrough of the game before playing. While admittedly, the gameplay is the strongest factor in making Dave the Diver stick out from other games released last year, with two main modes of gameplay, diving and sushi serving, along with the various side missions and mini games Dave needs to do to get by under or above water, I do believe the story is worth mentioning, so let's start right from the beginning. So our introduction to our protagonist, bearing the name Dave from the game's title, takes place when we see him lying down on a reclining chair by the beach during vacation. Hawaiian-inspired music in the background before his friend Cobra gives him a call for a business opportunity. To keep this shot of Dave lying down in mind, I'm going to come back to it, and almost immediately after that, he hops on a plane before the action can begin. So right off the bat, judging from this opening segment, we pick up a few bits about his character. First, we assume Dave must be off the job, given that he's on vacation away from the boat since he has to take a plane to get the game's events started. And secondly, since the title gives gives away what Dave's job is. Uh, to be clear, he's a diver, not a fisherman, hence Dave the Diver. It's noteworthy that he doesn't kill animals while off duty from diving, as he gently moves a hermit crab away from him after it climbs on top before Cobra's call. While Dave is on the phone before hopping his plane, Cobra invites him to come along to the sushi place he has been financing for a business opportunity to manage and to catch fish for cooking under Chef Bancho, a disciplined but ill-tempered sushi chef who, like Dave, took a break from what he's good at, albeit it wasn't exactly a vacation. Cobra also tells Dave about the giant blue hole, that is, how the ocean's surroundings under the sea are constantly changing, despite their boat remaining in the same place day and night while Dave is diving. This is a detail you will notice as you advance in the game, as certain fish will not be available. What's happening under the giant blue hole is also leading to strange events on land, such as the earthquake which causes damage at Bancho Sushi 
sushi on the very first day, and for which requires repairs. So let's dive. Yeah, fuck it, I'm leaving it there. Get used to hearing that a lot in this video, along with a little joke drum. Let's dive into how you navigate your underwater adventures for a moment. Almost immediately when you start off, getting used to your morning and afternoon diving routine is a learning curve, and you will not be able to take on the big boys like sharks or marlins, despite the catalog of guns to choose from and to enhance once you meet Duff later on. For most of my dives, I use my harpoon to catch fish, even if it remains at a basic level 1, without picking up temporary upgrades, and if I need a gun, I mostly rely on my sniper rifle to deal some needed damage when making catching fish easier, especially once you enter parts of the sea like the blue hole depths and the glacial area. However, relying on your harpoon at the beginning of the game means having to get used to making a few pokes for a smaller fish before finally catching it, and since this is the beginning, you'll have to get used to catching some basic blue and yellow tanks. As you advance to the game's later chapters, the fish encounters get tougher, and some fish will see you as a threat when you see the exclamation point above them, like Thresher Sharks, Dunkulotius, and Marlins. For some of these encounters, I wouldn't rely on my gun too much, or even my harpoon, only doing minimum damage with these weapons before using my dark gun. More on that later. As you enhance your equipment with upgrades, using your harpoon gets easier, and all you need to do to catch a shark is a few pokes. Take for instance Tiger Sharks, which are tougher initially if you're still equipping a level 1 harpoon, but upgrading it to its highest level means only poking it at least 4 times. You also bring a dinky little knife along with you while diving, and that's needed for cutting seaweed and much needed minerals for weapons upgrades. But it also makes killing fish messier, since fish caught while using a knife gives you a 1 star ranking. See also dropping rocks on crabs, and thus, I don't bother using my knife all that much, except for picking minerals like iron ore and amethyst for weapon upgrades. It's bad enough to get to that 300 fish caught achievement, but it's extremely painful to kill just 20 fish with a knife. However, since using guns to catch fish isn't necessary, an upgraded tranquilizer, dark gun, or net gun comes handy for your dives. Sure, it might take longer to catch a particular fish with a tranquilizer if not upgraded completely, but it rewards you with a 3 star ranking for fish caught with it, and the net for your net gun can be upgraded to be larger. Eventually, you get to make use of net traps, which you can set and wait to catch some tuna since they're a little tougher to ding with your harpoon despite their size, though they are pretty tasty if you take them to your sushi place. There's a risk when getting too comfortable with your diving routine, though. While Dave the Diver is a mostly forgiving gaming experience for casual gamers, you might get frustrated here and there if you run out of oxygen, whether it's from hanging out underwater for too long without repellishing your oxygen, or if you take too much damage while trying to catch, say, a shark or maybe while trying to run away from one of those pesky exploding blood bellied comb jellyfish in the blue hole depths. And I say this from experience, that's easily the worst experience in dealing with jellyfish, which doesn't involve actually going into jellyfish filled ocean water in real life. Yuck. The side effect of making it out to see another day above water is that you can only take one item with you, though you do get to choose which one. Perhaps the most maddening part about the cost-benefit exercise of diving too long and running out of oxygen is all of that time catching and netting so many different kinds of fish is wasted and forces me to think about how to navigate around, especially in the blue hole depths and glacial area. I feel like I died more during the epilogue portion of the game than the main story. Perhaps this was because I got too lazy to check in on myself and constantly risk getting myself in harm's way with so much fish already caught during one dive and already reaching capacity. I'll point to one example during my gameplay my numerous encounters with sharks. Maybe it's because I've grown up and learned more about shark behavior. Uh, no, I don't watch Shark Week every year. I had to Google most of my info on this. But I am not the 10-year-old watching the classic film Jaws and being petrified to even step foot into the shallow part of a beach. And I am aware some sharks don't find human meat tasty, which is why, since this is a virtual setting, I look forward to piling my cargo box with shark meat, and boy oh boy are there a lot of sharks. Tiger sharks, make sharks, hammerhead sharks, great white, numerous different kinds which can net you plenty of recipes for later. And so me as Dave, I look forward to going after them with ease. But while they are betrayed as intending to attack you, I almost feel bad for killing some of the sharks in Dave the Diver. They seem less like man-eaters and more like territorial animals, since they retreat back to their assigned location if you run away from an attack, as with other deadly fish. I will say though that the only shark which wasn't a pain wasn't even a boss like the Helicoprion 
Leon. No, it was the Thrasher Shark, which appears in the Blue Hole Shallows later in the game and can cause you an ache early on in your dives like it did to me, with me having to pace to the closest oxygen tank to refresh my oxygen. As you're exploring the various areas in the game, Dave can check on the fish and other sea creatures he's caught and killed so far by using the Maricon app on his smartphone provided to him by Sato. Because you get it, it's short for Satoshi, the original Japanese name for Ash, and he's like an aging, balding, overweight version of Ash from Pokemon, making you collect rare shiny Pokemon, or in this case, fish cards. That way, immature, fat-phobic gamer folks can call this character fat. Ash. Okay, I just want to make it clear that we here at the Armchair Brain do not in any way endorse fat phobia, and we strongly endorse body diversity in gaming since that has been much needed in recent years, but more on that later in this video. Anyway, choo -choo. as far as the game's overall mystery as to what is happening in the giant blue hole and the earthquakes happening underwater and on the surface, it's the opposite of a horrifically Lovecrafty and yet tragic story in the vein of Lucas Pope's Return of the Ubra Din, however fantastic and excellent that game is. During the game's later chapters, you'll see long extinct species of fish awaken, and yes, just like Uber Din, there are mermaids, aka sea people, and they have their own sea people village separate from the human world since they are initially distrustful of humans above sea, though unlike Uber Din, there aren't any kraken, which is a bit of a disappointment. Besides the boats, sushi place, and farms, there's no other surface level area where you can restock and refresh, and so in between the blue hole depths and the glacial area, the Sea People Village serves as a midpoint between the beginner to mid areas for diving, and the latter chapters where the mystery behind the earthquakes and ancient sea beasts awakening comes together. Of course, an easy, breezy, cozy game like Dave the Diver would be nothing if it didn't throw a challenge to the player here and there. And when it comes to the challenges, Dave the Diver has a pretty good roster of bosses from top to bottom, such as the Mantis Shrimp with its giant boxing gloves, which gives me NES punch out flashbacks, the easy giant squid and his vulnerable eye, great white claws, and the much more difficult and lengthy fights with Chronosaurus and Yowie later on. The boss fights vary in how the player fights them, and you can't always rely on your harpoon, but they're also just out of this world, almost to the point of comical, what with their various designs and modes of attack. In other words, Dave the Diver is the video game version of a self-aware kaiju movie. I mean, why else would the development team behind Dave the Diver release a mod featuring Godzilla? <laughs> But enough about the diving and mystery and story behind Dave the Diver. It's time to talk about my favorite part of playing Dave the Diver. My favorite part about playing Dave the Diver isn't the diving, the humor all across the game, or even the giant kaiju-like sea monster fights. No, no, no. It's wrapping up your day to make some sushi at, well, Bancho Sushi, which is run by, well, Chef Bancho. In fact, because of this feature, Dave the Diver might be the first video game in which it's only appropriate to be playing the restaurant portions of a game with your dinner. Seriously, no game has ever made me hungrier than Dave the Diver. I always save the dinner parts for dinner time. And also, this section of the essay allows me to title the name of this chapter from one of my childhood guilty pleasure movies released in the late 1990s, Deep Blue Sea. Bring me some sushi! So, full disclosure, when I was attending high school, I used to participate in my school's extracurricular marketing club, which competed throughout county, state, and national levels, and I only got as far as placing in the state level and just missing the national level, which cost me a trip to Disney World for a week in April of my senior year. Yeah, 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 I can hear the late comedian Bill Hicks rifting on people getting into marketing. Thankfully, I didn't go the route of a business or marketing education, and my commie Marxist socialist ass settled for a philosophy and religious studies degree, which I do try to make use of it here on this channel. Anyway, while nights at Banjo Sushi may not be as exciting or adventurous as surviving boss encounters with mammoth crabs and sharks for action-oriented gamers, I would argue managing the restaurant on busy nights is just as exciting as diving, especially when nights are busy with the special events for cooking specific meals with shark, tuna, and marlin ingredients. And since the restaurant is only open 
open on nights, and since diving at night will cost you one hour per night if you choose to do so. Trying to get to one customer to another in Dave's shoes can be tense, especially when you're starting to hand out drinks and some customers might walk out if you don't have enough time to get to them. Dave is, let's be polite and say, unable to enhance his sprint ability above water, unlike his weapons and equipment. Since Bancho is more invested in cooking meals and making them right, you as Dave have to manage the finances and staff, as well as making any interior improvements with seating, stereo speakers, and decorations and art. This aspect of the game reminds me of games of my boomer youth, where you're forced to make financial decisions, such as Roller Coaster Tycoon from the 90s, and if you were like me back then, if you really wanted to build some coasters to bring in cash, you would get impatient and just take out a loan and pay it later because you think constructing a merry-go-round is dull. Or maybe even The Sims, in which financial decisions like building another room or getting new furniture, or maybe a pool require you to climb the career and social ladder and work your lazy ass. At least that's how I remember playing the original Sims, which was a pretty physically conservative game, and let's be honest, not exactly set in our reality due to our country's allegiance to unfettered capitalism. But regardless, being a physically conservative game along with Roller Coaster Tycoon and The Sims, Dave the Diver, while not exactly a business 101 course on restaurant management, does show how the gamer cannot afford to slack off one night, and why it is important to know the right time to come up to the surface when diving and trying not to lose oxygen. As I said in the last chapter, Dave earns the ability to dive during the night for one hour only, and some side missions require you to dive at night, though you don't get to dive too deep as you can't swim into the blue depths. It's useful to be able to catch more fish and ingredients that are night exclusive, but these dives have the side effect of costing you an hour which could have been spent serving food at the sushi place, and it's especially unwise to spend another hour diving during events since those bring in more revenue. As manager, you will have to employ people to manage the busy night since you will have your hands tied, and you have to train your staff to achieve special abilities for serving or cooking. But as you advance, you have to think carefully about who you employ, who you assign to cooking or serving, which employees you train either just enough to get by or maybe all the way to level 20, the highest ranking, and which employees you choose to fire. And be careful about this last one, depending on the employee ranking, you might save money or lose money. Because of the emphasis on keeping your business afloat by overworking yourself, not just with the sushi job at Bancho Sushi, but also diving, the fish farm, and Otto's farm, I would argue that Dave the Diver is an example of a conservative game, at least in the sense of being physically conservative, in that through Dave's shoes, hard working in a capitalist society pays off in the end, but we can come back to this point later. Being able to manage the finances of Bancho Sushi calls back to the two games of my youth I brought up before, the original roller Coaster Tycoon and the original Sims, where you're constantly thinking about how you choose to spend money and having to make decisions for life to go on and or your business to survive. Essentially, this, despite not being restricted by real world economic decisions, you're simulating money management. As stated in the last chapter, during your Dave the Diver sushi nights, there are special occasions where you have to prepare special meals for events, which means you have to go diving and catch some tuna, marlins, or sharks, maybe some sea grapes as long as you have access to the limestone cave. The benefit here is, between this and serving specialty meals for VIP guests, you have the potential to make a ton of money to buy yourself suit and equipment upgrades, which means more opportunities to catch more and even bigger fish as you progress in the game. And if you keep up with your diving and keep catching new species of fish, the fish farm you get access to later on in the game will always have their tanks filled with fish, crabs, and whatnot for you to send to the sushi place or sell for money. And for more farming fun, Otto's farm, where he and later on his son Sam, aka MC Sammy, have necessary ingredients for you to buy, and crops to attend to like tomatoes, rice, and garlic to water, and way to grow. And this farm is useful to help make special recipes at the sushi place and maybe a fruit dish beyond on catching fish. Speaking of which, as you're completing your catalog of caught fish on the Marika app, and the more you do research into different meals, the number of recipes you can make increases, giving you plenty of options as long as you have the right amount of fish portions and ingredients. You're usually reminded of the amount needed for a particular meal when you have to do a side mission involving a VIP customer. But if you're just winging it during the epilogue section like I did, well then you might as well fill up your upgraded cargo box to capacity. Enhancing your meals means 
means increases in prices per serving and an increase in taste. Later on in the game, the second sushi branch you open towards the end of the game means the potential to make even more money, as long as you're able to handle managing both places with staffing and ingredients. I found that making Maki the manager at the second place was appropriate to complete her character arc, but in comparison to other staff members, although she is statistically the best at cooking, her stats aren't good elsewhere, so maybe when I replay this game, I might switch up the manager role and assign her to the kitchen. She's already at a high role for the cooking position, at least for me. So as far as what you can serve on each night, you can choose up to 7 dishes before opening the restaurant, depending on your ranking, on the Cooks the Cooking app on your phone, and you can also send fish and other ingredients to the second sushi place. Just one look at this menu is enough to make any gamer's tongue water, which is why it's so appropriate to play these portions of the game while having dinner. On the other hand, no, we're not quite there yet. In contrast to the various meals and dishes you could potentially serve, the drinks available on Bancho Sushi are kinda mid, in my opinion. I mean, green tea is fine, maybe not an evening drink for me, and sure, there's beer, but it's not a big name brand like Guinness or Budweiser. Not even beer made from a local brewery that Dave and company support by selling it at the establishment. Just beer. And then, they're serving cocktails. Oh cocktails, why does this have to be a little too difficult at first? It's one thing to be careful about the amount of beer you put into a beer jug, but it's another when customers give you a curveball and tell you to give customers a mixed drink. Once I was given the option to serve cocktails after a certain amount of successful VIP meals, I struggled tremendously trying to get the appropriate amount of blue, yellow, or pink drink in each serving. Uh, I'm not sure what the color coding is supposed to mean with cocktails. Cocktails. Does yellow mean beer? Does pink mean a fruit drink? Does blue mean, uh, cool blue Gatorade? Uh, whatever. Not only do I absolutely suck at serving cocktails, but this game does not consider cocktails a drink like green tea or beer. That means your assigned servers who can serve drinks can't serve cocktails, and so unless one of your employees can cover cocktails, you will have to do the mixing. Well, at the very least, if you employ Raptor, yes, really, his name really is Raptor. Not only is he quick to make sure you have enough wasabi to serve meals for customers, but he can serve cocktails for you, as with Dre. The funny thing about fucking up the cocktails during the game is how much this applied to myself learning to adult and serve myself drinks now that I've been drinking age for over a decade and some. Psst, minus those teenage shenanigans in high school, Shh. It's easy to give yourself a cold brew of black coffee in the morning or crack open a cold can of big seltzer. But when it comes to mixed drinks and trying to master a special kind of chocolate martini or a Bloody Mary, or if I'm feeling dumb, either a Jack and Coke or maybe settle for a chocolate milk, a <laughs> uh, chocolate almond milk for my vegetarian ass. I learned from playing the game that my impression of how I could adapt to learning new tricks with beverages took time and patience, and I was not always successful. But hey, to go back to that quote from the introduction, it's never a bad time during the day to give yourself a present. Now, before I start diving deeper into my analysis of the game for these next few chapters, I want to read a Reddit post from the Cozy Gamer subreddit, which had over 250 likes. Before I read it, I want to be clear that I do not read this to openly mock the opinions of the author of the original post, nor do I support harassing this person, however abrasive the original post may be. And if you harass this person, you are not welcome here, but rather to highlight how being turned off by the many, many tasks and objectives the game throws at you is missing the broader point Dave the Diver is trying to make, at least from my perspective. <gasps> Everybody saying Dave the Diver is cozy. I hate it. It wound me up so much. I just wanted to play a relaxing diving slash sushi making game, and the game flat out refuses to give me that. Every single Doshgar in game day, it's, Hey Dave, fetch me this. Hey Dave, here's a fish trading card game. Hey Dave, here's a camera for photographing fish. Manage your social media account, because that's fun. Put out hiring notices. Respond to hiring notices. File taxes on your sushi restaurant. Offer grievance counseling to your sushi chef. Oh, and your three hours into the game, and we're still throwing new mechanics and new menus and new interfaces at you. Just let me play the damn game. I just want to dive and fish. I do not care about freaking hiring people or fish card games. Stop throwing 547 different game mechanics at me and give the game 5 seconds to dang breathe. 
slash rant over. What I wanted and was expecting was the freeform Stardew experience of here is a farm, here is a hoe, have at it. I did not get this with Dave the Diver. Oh, okay. So that's quite an interesting take on the game, to say the least. Not surprising coming from Reddit. So let's respectfully respond. I will concede that it can be overwhelming to deal with at least five or seven different tasks to do during gameplay. To give you an example, in advanced stages of Dave the Diver, I was checking in on the fish farm and Otto's farm before my morning dive, unless Otto gave me a call in the afternoon or evening to let me know crops had grown and see if I need to take with me some fruits and vegetables. Maybe throw in a mobile minigame in between my to-do list for good measure? Then after my first morning dive, sort out that night's meals for Bancho Sushi as well as the second branch while dealing with staff training and recipe research before my afternoon dive. Then if I needed to, do a night dive before we serve sushi. And that doesn't include any side quests or VIP meals or events, or even needing to stop by the sea village for a dumpling power-up. Yes, dumplings for power-ups do exist thanks to the sea people village restaurant owner Mima. That's roughly seven or more things to do all in a single Dave as Dave the Diver. So I understand where this Reddit user is coming from, and yet it reads to me like he's ready to throw in the towel early and doesn't have the patience to play all the way through. I'm sympathetic to feeling like I want to give up early on a game like this because I have been there with other games as well as books and films in more ways than one. However, being able to multitask in Dave the Diver is the whole point of being able to be the game. Because Dave is just like us today, having things to do in our schedules, constantly having to get used to routines, and then having to change such routines when life doesn't go our own way. So taking your time while diving and sushi serving should be this game's motto besides taking a breather to enjoy the simple things in life. Hence, you know, the title of this video essay. Besides, Dave the Diver wasn't even the first game to employ multitasking, or even checking in on multiple tasks and objectives for players to complete or pay attention to. The Grand Theft Auto 3 trilogy series has you going to dozens of places to do main and side mission objectives without much rest, and yet we know these games are fiction. These GTA games simulate a crime fantasy and pay tribute to the gangster film genre, and despite the entertainment value these games bring, I could hear this same Reddit user arguing, if this was two decades ago, when talking about GTA Vice City specifically, why do I need to invest in properties like the Malibu Club or Pole Position when all I want to do is shoot shit? Likewise, Dave the Diver also wasn't the first game to have mini games within the base game, and fetching for things and taking care of other tasks while you're solving the mystery behind the giant blue hole all while being in Dave's shoes is why Dave's adventure speaks more to our average lives than gamers might think, because Dave's life is work and play, dive, and then squeeze a minigame in between all of the action and adventure. Speaking of minigames, this Reddit post reminded me of a recent article on the Ubisoft game Skulls and Bones, published for PC Gamer, which was shared on Twitter. No, I am not calling that site that other name, in which the CEO of Ubisoft defended the game's price tag of $70. Uh, the game hasn't done well with critics, by the way. But full disclosure, again, I haven't played it yet, so who knows. I posted a reply on Twitter after reading it saying, Dave the Diver costs like 20 bucks and it plays like there's 10 games all in one. Uh, should have added $26 if you count the deluxe edition. And if you have played the game before or intend on doing so after this video essay is over, you will know that this is more than just a joke tweet for myself. If you take into consideration diving, sushi serving, fish farming, crop farming, seahorse racing, gambling, the mini games on Dave's cell phone, and Dave's covert sea blue spying and following Momo and to his cat family, that's right around 10 different games or more all in one single game game. While one could argue that most of these activities are filler since they're not the main game activities like diving and sushi serving, and gamers aren't mandated to do them all in one day and can even skip diving and serving, for those looking to be completists, there's something remarkable about getting the player occupied with one activity to the next all in a day with this game's variety of activities and world building. With Dave the Diver, there is a sense of accomplishment in getting so much shit done, even during one of your day's diving sessions. So reading the this Reddit post was like seeing the exact opposite of how I felt about the game experience of Dave the Diver, in that the game played into the meta-narrative of how we're all trying to navigate our own lives with so much going on that we can't take a tropical break, which separates this game from other recent games taking place by the sea or under. 
This might be subjective, but based on my observations, some of the most popular games which have taken place under the sea deal with the unknown, which in effect creates anxiety for the gamer and makes us panic in the moment because we're not thinking clearly upon first gameplay. To name a few examples, Subnautica is an underwater survival game with an emphasis on exploring the game's alien open world, or in this case, sea, and games like Dredge and Uber Din add a Lovecraftian flair to their respective sea adventures with sea monsters to add to the horrifying tension for each game's setting. And if we're going to look back at other games involving sea creatures, the classic first game in the Sega series Echo the Dolphin features time travel to take on alien baddies as gamers have to get used to swimming fast and hardly pressing the pause button. While their stories vary in their complexity, they would amount to nothing if they didn't bring innovation, thrill, and or just plain fun to their different styles of gameplay, especially with the original Echo. And speaking of dolphins, Dave the Diver not only has has dolphins, but they come in different colors like the Yoshis in Super Mario. Sweet, this game's got everything. Anyway, Dave the Diver shares many qualities with these games apart from being under the sea, from trying to survive each dive and maintaining enough oxygen, action-packed boss fights with kaiju, and fish and whales which feel alien compared to real marine life. And it even deals with the uncertainty as to what happens next in these characters' lives come the ending. Except Dave the Diver is also a comedy which is self-aware enough to know not to take itself too seriously. And that can also be applied to the life of Dave and the various main and side characters in Dave's universe. For better or worse, Dave the Diver's story isn't complicated compared to these games, not that it automatically deducts points for being so, but also the gameplay isn't too difficult once you get past the prologue and first chapter. And yes, it's kind of a funny coincidence that as I am editing and polishing and rambling throughout this script, Nintendo just released Endless Ocean Luminous, which is the third release in the Endless Ocean franchise, an obscure gaming franchise which initially started out on Nintendo's Wii and which shares some similarities with Dave the Diver beyond the game taking place underwater. And there's also another Crab's Treasure, another Souls-like game I hope to get attached to. Another win for cozy underwater gaming. And also, why in the hell hasn't Nintendo put out a Switch re-release for the Wind Waker yet? I get that the GameCube is one tough cookie to try to put games on Nintendo Switch online, but this wait's getting just as stressful as Silk Song. There's your mandatory Silk Song reference. Tangent aside, I think it is worth mentioning that Dave the Diver was initially conceived as a mobile game, at least according to this trailer on Facebook. So you know how I use the term self-aware to describe the game's hilarious boss fights? Well, this game's biggest example of being self-aware is your pause menu being a phone with a menu resembling the menu interface of an iPhone. Let me tell you another full disclosure, once again. While in the game, the phone serves a purpose for main objectives and making calls to characters in order to progress the story. I can tell you right now that I have a love-hate relationship with my iPhone, in that I do not like carrying it around and looking at it for too long as it is a major distraction from watching television or being able to enjoy a long nature hike outside. Unless I happen to be playing Pokemon Go, and yet for you, me, and pretty much everyone in this world, if we're privileged enough, we all carry a phone like our keys and wallet because we have gotten used to the idea in our capitalist society that a cell phone is necessary not just for communication for repair and emergency services, friends and family, but to serve as a distraction from our reality that, at times, we get too attached to. Whether it's doom scrolling on TikTok or Twitter, or playing mobile games like Pokemon Go. And for Dave the Diver, the game is self-aware that a phone is a necessity to fulfill game requirements, even if pausing the action is keeping us from getting all the pleasures of enjoying the game. And as a bonus feature, which was mentioned before, just as playing Dave the Diver is a nice cozy distraction from our reality, the mini-games featured in Dave the Diver, Leah's Run, Gaio and Space Diver, the latter which you unlock at the end of the game's main story, serves as a breather for the real action. So, what really makes Dave the Diver a cozy or pleasure game? Well, we know Dave the Diver wasn't the first pleasure game in gaming history, as the Reddit user does mention Stardew Valley, and that game is certainly a breather to kill time. In fact, a good case for the first pleasure game in video game history might be Tetris, because it's a game you don't have to think too much about story and theme, unlike Dave the Diver. And also, it's a game which is easy for casual gamers to get into a flow with. Hint hint for later. 
but for the sake of timing, I think a good working definition for a cozy game would be a cozy game meaning a game which may require a learning curve, but doesn't make difficulty the point of playing the game. A cozy game might get hard at times, but trying to beat it is like a mouse trying and failing before succeeding in getting to the cheese in a maze. However, what do we mean when we say we get pleasure out of a game like Dave the Diver? Or for that matter, any cozy or pleasure game? Are we talking about getting pleasure in finally catching a tiger shark for the first time after failing to avoid its attack, and then catching once again to serve extra dishes of tiger sushi at Bancho Sushi? Or maybe being able to complete seahorse races without hesitation? Hmm, seahorse races, this game has everything. For one thing, there's a word which developers allow the players to have. Choice. Dave the Diver, like games before it, takes into consideration the individual choice of gamers to do whatever, and nobody is compelling you to keep catching the same fish or serve the same dishes every night or, for that matter, even bother to dive or cook in the first place. In fact, you could choose to skip the diving and sushi activities altogether, though it comes with the risk of having money issues with banjo sushi if no fish and ingredients are being brought in. But if we choose not to skip playing hooky on diving and sushi serving, as gamers, why do we keep diving and serving? Why are we so invested in the life of one man when our lives have so many things going on? I think a book which could help inform us on this matter is the 2012 self-help book The Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do in Life and Business by journalist Charles Duhigg. In this book, the author explains a method for how people can make and keep new habits, and while I understand some of the audience might be turned off given that it's made to entice business leaders, aka bosses, there's some decent practical advice in here that's useful for gamers and others looking to develop new habits, beat procrastination, and perhaps create new hobbies to get stuff done. So the cycle of learning a new habit and keeping it is 1. Q. A Q being quote a trigger that tells your brain to go into automatic mode and which habit to use. 2. Routine. We do that routine, or habit, which according to Duig, can be physical or mental. Maybe it's taking some time during your day to clean your personal space, ahem. Or maybe it's going for a daily run. And number 3. Reward. This one is self-explanatory. Quote, helps your brain figure out if this particular loop is worth remembering for the future. For us in the real world, that reward could be anything, like taking some time to play a video game. And for Dave in the virtual world, it's money and friends. Of course, we are in fact not Dave the Diver, and since our lives are subject to environment, economic, or personal factors, predictable or not, and maybe you need a little breather from this routine and cycle, you could say a fourth step is necessary to complete the circle, repeat slash change habit or routine when necessary, and this is a point the book makes, though that step is not included. Maybe in a month or year after playing Dave the Diver, you'll move on to another game or maybe games. And this applies to our own habits and routines, that we have to adapt to changes and expect them. Also, sticking to one daily routine is kind of dull. In Dave the Diver, you have so many ways to play the game, manage your sushi plays, and organize your diving schedule. You could head straight down into the shallows or use the mirror to teleport to the glacial area, or just go straight to the Sea People Village. For me, I had stuck to a routine of going to the shallows, the depths the village and the glacial area before coming up to the surface. Likewise with maintaining profitability at Bancho Sushi for restaurant upgrades, staff hirings, and meal research and enhancements. Your meals are contingent on which fish and ingredients you bring in and the stage in your game's progress. And since I am such a shark slayer in the virtual world, no not like that, most of my dishes at night tend to include shark ingredients, although I will say that, being fond of attending to the crops at Otto's farm, I do try to include dishes with vegetables. In a sense, you, like me, aren't thinking when you play. You just do. This plays into Dave the Diver being a much more forgiving and mindful game compared to its aforementioned underwater contemporaries, in that much of the gameplay and progression of the story relies on the player learning to quote-unquote take their time and to not be so flustered if they lose every so often and why it's not a problem to lose all of your oxygen for one dive. I have spoken before on how mindfulness, the act of being self-aware in the present moment through meditation or in other activities during our lives, is unfortunately co-opted mostly by Western intellectuals and corporations, becoming less about workers and employees becoming better workers and people, and rather becoming more compliant with their weakening labor conditions, while secularizing aspects of Buddhism for Western audiences, thus dulling the true practice of mindfulness. In other words, make mindfulness, as one of my favorite 
favorite books on the topic is so appropriately titled. This does not mean a daily meditation practice is something we should not do, as there are many positive benefits to the practice like lowering blood pressure and making sleep easier. It's just that we have to be more mindful, see what I did there, to be self-aware of our own health and our surroundings, all while acknowledging the problematic co-opting of mindfulness by capitalism, and to recognize that being mindful means being aware that some societal problems are so massive in scale that simply coming together and saying kumbaya will not solve them. Yet even if we solve society's problems or a majority of them, we would still have our own individual struggles that don't have that same massive scope. It could be as small as trying to go through a thousand or so page book for the first time in life, or maybe training to complete a marathon, or maybe in my case, and maybe yours, my constant struggle to overcome writer's block to complete this script. The fact is, life will throw a curveball at you more than a few times a day, and maybe a relaxing Saturday will all go to ruin when you're fooled by a slider or splitter, and on that rare day you procrastinate or something for too long, or maybe even forget to do on the day of, it'll throw you a high 100 mile an hour fastball. But enough of the baseball analogies. Mindfulness shouldn't be about shutting off or denying our anger. Because as one very wise philosopher once said in the 1990s, anger is a gift. Sometimes anger is the appropriate response to a particular situation. And yeah, there's a pleasure which comes from said anger and venting, albeit it's probably not the healthiest avenue for venting. Perhaps it's a boss calling you to take a night shift on your weekend off. And in that case, if your boss says that shit, say fuck you, I quit. Uh, to be clear, I am not responsible if you do say that to your boss. But anger isn't always appropriate, and while video games can bring out the best in us, there's a reason that angry video gamer stereotype still lingers in the back of non-gamer minds. In fact, sticking to Dave the Diver, it's not worth it to say, get mad because you keep losing to Yaoi even though it should be so damn easy with this big fucking gun, what the f See, that was a Doom reference. Dave the Diver does reference a lot of games quite a bit and it's kinda funny. Moving on, like I said before, I'm a philosophy and religious studies graduate, aka an upper middle class young adult who thought he was smarter than he actually was, and I was studying at college at a time when I started out on YouTube in the YouTube atheist community. Ah yes, the atheist community, that group of quote-unquote enlightened intellectuals who used to think reading a Sam Harris or Dawkins or Hitchens book on atheism automatically made us smarter than religious people. Anyway, while at college, I was well acquainted with reading the classic works of Greek philosophy, especially Plato and Aristotle. Well, more like being required to read Plato and Aristotle during my course, and because I needed some summer work and money, I had to help prep with my professor for the fall semester when this class would be taught. While it's easy to dismiss philosophy as glorified navel-gazing, a term which I remember one YouTube atheist vlogger of old once said, and let's be honest, some of the main figureheads in philosophy had some problematic views of their own, however brilliant their writing was. Just like with self-help books, there are some readings in philosophy which could enlighten people as to how to live their lives, and what is the right thing to do to bring the greatest outcome in a situation. For example, Plato's The Republic contains some passages on eudaimonia, or happiness or well-being, as well as some outdated views. This is Greek philosophy, after all. And as one writer summarizes Plato's views on happiness, quote, Happiness or well-being, eudaimonia, is the highest aim of moral thought and conduct, and the virtues, i.e. excellence, are the disposition skills needed to attain it. Keep this in mind when we get to Aristotle in a moment. Yet another reading, the Symposium, which consists of a dialogue between Socrates and a number of other speakers after eating, deals with the subject of love, and at one point Socrates brings up a conversation he had with a woman named Diodema, who was a sort of expert on love, and during this conversation they agreed that happiness, like love, was an end in itself. Quote, That's what makes happy people happy, isn't it? Possessing good things. There's no need to ask further. What's the point of wanting happiness? Being a philosophical consequentialist slash utilitarian myself since college, it would be incorrect to argue that Socrates was being a utilitarian in the vein of John Stuart Mill, but when reading the entire dialogue and that passage, it's difficult not to be fascinated by it. Yet, happiness is a little bit more than simply possessing good things, and certainly not enough to describe what makes Dave and Dave the Diver happy at the end of his story. 
Aristotle, being part of the big three of Greek philosophers and Plato's prodigy, was a proponent of the field of ethics called virtue ethics, which, according to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, quote, emphasizes the virtues, or moral character. Aristotle, in addition to writings in metaphysics and aesthetics, wrote about living a happy life in his classic text, The Nicomachean Ethics, that happiness was necessary to live a fully virtuous life. In his view, non-human animals and children were not capable of knowing what happiness is, and in his words, quote, happiness demands not only complete goodness, but a complete life. To him, a happy man is, quote, one who is active in accordance with a complete virtue, and who is adequately furnished with external goods, and that not for some unspecific period, but throughout a complete life, and destined both to live in this way and to die accordingly, because the future is obscure to us, and happiness we maintain to be an end in every way utterly final and complete. And I think it's Aristotle's views, which align more with Dave, than Plato's depiction of Socrates in Symposium. Dave's actions in the game are complete goodness, because they're not malicious or serving another end, aka following in line with Kant's categorical imperative. And even though we don't know what happens after Yahweh is put down, Dave the Diver has a complete life in Aristotle's world at his story's end, even if his life can go on in the epilogue. However, another philosopher I was fond of reading and learning from, and one which I think is more relevant to our discussion on happiness and pleasure in games like Dave the Diver, was Epicurus, the Greek philosopher born long after Plato and Aristotle had passed in ancient Greece, and one philosopher I took time to look into his beliefs further, from reading up on the problem of evil, which would later become a classic argument to either refute the existence of God, or, if a god actually exists, to call him unworthy of worship, to his writings on happiness and pleasure. In fact, there's a collection of his writings called, well, The Art of Happiness, and in this book, there's a writing entitled Letter to Menoceus, and here he writes on how the goal for a happy life is to seek a life of pleasure free of pain, and this not only helps to describe Dave's life at the beginning and end of the game, but also how we, as gamers, should strive to get the most out of cozy pleasure games. Thus, when I say that pleasure is the goal of living, I do not mean the pleasures of libertines or the pleasures inherent in positive enjoyment, as is supposed by certain persons who are ignorant of our doctrine, or who are not in agreement with it, or who interpret it perversely. I mean, on the contrary, the pleasure that consists in freedom from bodily pain and mental agitation. The pleasant life is not the product of one drinking party after another, or of the seafood and other delicacies afforded by a luxurious table. On the contrary, it is the result of sober thinking, namely, investigation of the reasons for every act of choice, and aversion and elimination of those false ideas about the gods and death which are the chief source of mental disturbances." End of quote. So, talking about ancient philosophy as it relates to a game released only a year ago might have put a good few of you gamers to sleep, and if that's the case, I apologize. But besides looking at how virtuous, happy, and content Dave is as a character, for which we will look more into during the character analysis in Chapter 6, I want to hone in on why and how we get pleasure in video games, keeping that last quote from Epicurus in mind. In terms of playing video games, I think there is a difference between getting pleasure out of finally beating a boss like, say, Judgment in Hyperlight Drifter, Ganondorf and his stages in Tears of the Kingdom, and especially the Radiance in Hollow Knight for the first time versus beating the Radiance for the 100th or so time just for the hell of it. Especially in the case of Hollow Knight, you spend so many hours trying to find out which charms work for the various bosses and which don't, trying out regular speed or steel soul runs, or doing the Pantheons, that the whole world of hollowness just flows through so that we don't need to use our map and or equip Wayward Compass, unless that's the one charm you want to use during your death run in P5, good luck with that. And it gets to the point that when you don't think when you beat bosses, the more you have gotten immersed with the virtual world you interact with, yet you don't get as stressed out beating the Radiance compared to the first time you were struggling, or for that matter, any game boss or challenge. In other words, you're playing games for the sake of playing and just going with the flow. Hmm, flow. That word has a greater impact than some gamers might think, and this is applicable in the case of playing hours and hours of Dave the Diver. The late Hungarian-American psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, wow, I can't believe I didn't fuck that name up, based upon years of research, is responsible for coining the term to describe a state of mind, and as he explained fully and thoroughly in the book Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience, 
Quote, flow is the way people describe their state of mind when consciousness is harmoniously ordered and they want to pursue whatever they are doing for its own sake, end of quote. The relationship between video games and flow, though only having begun in recent years, has tried to demonstrate and show how gamers being completely immersed in the games they play mirrors other activities we engage in outside of gaming. While there is criticism of flow and its relationship to video games, and which I think is worthy to read and explore as it's similar to the way mindfulness practice can be co-opted by corporations to individualize people's problems, which I I could explore for another time. Flow was a concept that, as a lifelong gamer, I never thought could be applied to the medium of gaming, and I should have known seeing as how I have played my fair share of Tetris at my high school library, pretending I was writing a history paper on JFK. Regardless, there is promising research being done at the University of California, Riverside, which is summarized in this nice little article. Detailing flow, video games, and how to balance both, not making gaming too easy or difficult. Quote, the people who play Tetris the normal way, where the game gets more challenging over time, reported a lot more flow than people in the other groups, and they also felt less worried and reported more positive feelings while they waited. And it's not hard for me to see why, as I, myself, am a massive sim for Tetris. A game like Tetris has no storyline, no plot, nothing but a simple concept and to-do list for players. Accumulate different types of blocks, straight lines, boxes, L-shaped, Z-shaped, line them up to lower the amount of blocks, and don't let the blocks fill all the way up to the top. Although it's a game that gets faster in the end, the more you've become comfortable lining up bricks and forming lines to achieve a higher score, the game isn't that difficult. And you could say the higher pace and difficulty flow quite well the more experience you have. It's all about being able to react when blocks drop in higher levels. Also, according to the implications of this paper titled The Relationship Between Character Identification and Flow States Within Video Games, flow activity in gamers was shown to increase as they were able to identify with the player, especially when it came to being able to customize their player. Now, while you can't necessarily change the way Dave looks and Dave the diver, apart from which charms, gadgets, and weapons he uses. I would argue that the fact Dave comes off as an average person compared to other video game protagonists makes it easier for gamers to identify with Dave the character, at least when it comes to trying to get by in life, but more on that in chapter 6. The combination of flow and mindfulness, when totally aware, can make for some of the most productive activity, and this includes the way we can become better gamers and, speaking of pleasure, making for some of the most memorable quote-unquote cozy gaming, like in Tetris, Stardew Valley, and Dave the Diver. But it isn't just limited to the way we game. Just think about the things you need to get done, like say, completing a chore or task which needs to get done, or maybe trying to achieve a goal in your real life which doesn't include looking at a screen for too long. Getting stuff done feels like a reward in its own right, and video games, in fact I say nearly all video games, are a hedonistic practice all for pleasure once you get the hang of it. Not necessarily the same as enjoying and savoring a healthy, well-cooked meal or being able to complete a 20-mile hike, but games, when played mindfully and through flow, without overthinking everything should be the goal. This is why, despite me rambling again, it's so crucial to discuss the intersection between between philosophy and video games. Speaking of philosophy and video games, whoa, look at that, it's a Bioshock reference. Holy shit, the game developers fucking reference Bioshock in the best way possible. This game's got everything. I swear to God, I laughed my ass off for three minutes straight after this cutscene. And yes, of course, being a veteran Bioshock gamer, I chose to rescue the squid and got rewarded for it, just like if you were saving the little sisters. But to summarize and get back to that Reddit post at the beginning of this chapter, what makes Dave the Dive are so special as a quote-unquote cozy game and addicting to play is that Dave the Diver rewards the gamer by applying the game's lessons to our lives and trying to find positivity in our short lives despite all the negativities which come with it. Alright, we're done with all the self-help talk. Let's touch on a lighter subject before my main character study.
One aspect of gaming which I often neglect to dive deeper into while writing my video essays is the importance of knowing which parts of your soundtrack fit in with a particular scene or in this case gaming area. One of Dave the Diver's positive qualities gamers will notice immediately upon loading their save file is the variety of good or great background songs the game's soundtrack has and how appropriately placed each song is set. Put it this way, imagine loading The Sims on your old Dell PC for the first time 20 years ago, and upon loading the game and hearing the bossa nova music, you hear the jazzy piano and vibraphone music as you overlook your game's neighborhood, and as you play and construct your house and buy furniture, you hear a wide variety of genres for each mode of playing, like jazzy piano and classical music. That's the same experience with Dave the Diver. A whole host of music from a wide range of genres, each song appropriately placed in each area. For example, the game's main menu music upon opening up the game gives up optimistic vibes, which despite Dave the Diver diving into deep places underwater, never goes away completely as you finish the game's main story. Have you ever seen one of those shirts with the slogan, Life is Good on the back of them? Yeah, that's Dave the Diver's soundtrack, and this song in a nutshell. The boat music in between morning, afternoon, and evening dives, and while talking and shopping with Cobra, is relaxing to calm the gamer before diving and or fighting a boss. The blue hole shallows and depths feature music which fit the gamer's skill level when learning more and more about tougher, meatier, and meaner fish. Plus, the switch from songs when you enter the blue hole depths from the shallows lets you know that there's no going back from diving with training wheels. The song when you go into the glacier area and above the hydrothermal fence, and before heading for the ancient control room, adds to the game's wonder and mysterious vibes as you learn more about the prehistoric fish and beast awakening. The boss music is fitting for the various kaiju fights under the sea, like fighting the giant squid and the mantis shrimp, among other others, specifically the song Tunnel of Darkness, which adds tension for beginning players while getting them excited for the fight. Since the game is forgiving enough to let you restart your boss fight if you lose oxygen to a boss and not make you awaken on a boat, Dave the Diver, after all, has game mechanics which are unconventional for dealing with these beasts and other fish. You get used to hearing it and pump your head to this song. This isn't boss music, this is an underwater rave. However, the final boss fight against Yaoi is the complete opposite. Being that this is the longest boss fight in the game and that you'll probably lose more to this agent beast despite your massive final weapon you use made by Duff. The song is eerie, unworldly, but also, like previous boss fight music, anxiety filled, adding to the uncertainty as to whether or not you'll succeed the first time in putting this agent beast down. Of course, I cannot do a proper soundtrack review without mentioning the sweet, chillaxing beats you hear while getting the restaurant ready in the morning and afternoon, then while serving at night and when VIP customers come in to try out Mancho's dishes. Songs like Restaurant Prep and Serve, Serve, Serve are such absolute bangers you can't help but pump them up while driving your car away from your designated gaming corner at home. And Welcome to My Bistro adds a nice touch of lo-fi hip-hop jazz to this mix. Sometimes the soundtrack will throw a curveball at you when you're not expecting it. For example, I assume that the hip-hop song Hot Pepper Tuna was made exclusively for the game and written for the side character MC Sammy, the son of Otto who reunites with his father in an emotional cutscene, but nope. It turns out that Hot Pepper Tuna is an actual song put out by Korean rapper Go K that was released almost exactly a decade before Dave the Diver's release. Now, this could have been a potential blunder given that the song's release predates the game, but nope again. Not only is the song used well, but since Bancho is a fan of Sammy's music, it sounds appropriate when you have the Tuna Sushi event at Bancho Sushi. However, I think my favorite piece of music from the soundtrack is the Beluga ride you pay for seven by while hanging out at the Sea People Village, making traveling across the village easy while relaxing to the song. In fact, this Beluga song is so darn great that I did a nice little minimalist piano rendition of the piece for the introduction chapter of this essay, in case your ears were paying attention. It's just a shame you can't take the Beluga and this song with you outside of the village apart from one mission. Dave the Diver's soundtrack makes for one of the best listens, even without playing the game, and argue could sit right on top of some of gaming's best soundtracks and songs including the various emotional pieces in Ocarina of Time, which either invoke the blissful moments of youth like Soraya's song or the bitter sweetness of finding adult life difficult like Zelda's theme. System Shock 2 and its combination of techno tension and alien ambient music as you progress in the game, and especially Hollow Knight, in which every area of the night visits in Hollowness 
has their own musical piece, all thanks to Christopher Larkin's excellent score. Music can make the difference between a casual playthrough and a thought-provoking and engaging gaming experience. And since the majority of the game's songs are upbeat, the soundtrack fits well with the game's theme of optimism and life enjoyment. Another aspect of making great gaming experiences is sound design, specifically in the case of Dave the Diver. Ambience is one thing, and Dave the Diver being a game which takes place underwater and around a beach community, it only makes sense if the underwater sound effects were relaxing as well, like you're really diving deep if you've got headphones on. Even the little details you hear, like Dave lifting up a boulder and him struggling to hold on, is very relaxing every time he hums. <laughs> The sound effects in this game are distinct and can either alert you like your low oxygen warning or when you're just swimming deeper to get to another area. And there is nothing more satisfying than hearing the sound of a shark dying after a nasty fight. Dave the Diver is another example in gaming which shows that the greatest video games are effective at putting you in the scene with fantastic sound design. For example, go back to System Shock 2 on the difference between being on the med side deck on the Von Braun with beeping medical machines and devices in the background versus the disorienting, eerie, and appropriately alien feel when you enter the Rickenbacker before entering the body of the many. Overall, Dave the Diver's sound design and soundtrack when combined with a game taking inspiration from other great video games and its pixelated and 3D artwork help to make a complete gaming experience, and it's only fitting that the game's main story ending concludes with joyful, pleasant music, which shows Dave and all the characters getting on with their life. Oh my god, did that Yaoi car just cry out the sound of a hydralisk from StarCraft? It did! It's a StarCraft reference! This fucking game gets me! Jokes aside, it's time to do a character analysis of the game's primary character, who bears the name of this great game. So, some of you might be wondering, why bother with all of this discussion about philosophy, themes, meaning, and, for this chapter, a character analysis for such a simple character like Dave, and all this about a game with a basic premise and a mostly cozy, easy mode of gameplay? Does all of this navel-gazing about gaming amount to a gigantic waste of time? Well, I have said this before and I will repeat it again and again until I can no longer breathe. Video games are not just an entertainment medium to be consumed by the masses so that you don't have to think too hard, say Pac-Man or Super Mario Brothers, or even part of a giant multi-billion dollar business with all of its follies. But when examined with wider eyes, one can view video games as another form of literature, albeit one which combines the world building a novelist types on a typewriter, a film screenwriter puts out when presenting dialogue, and a composer writing notes on sheet paper, or in modern times, computes on Ableton or FL Studio, maybe. The point is to not simply state that, even though this statement is absolutely true, every form of art and entertainment is political, because everything is political one way or another. But by allowing us to consider fields of study like philosophy and psychology in our analysis of media, it can help inform us about the ways we consume art and entertainment like video games, as it will allow us to critically think about the ways video games say something about our lives. Now, to set the stage for why I absolutely dig the hell out of Dave the character, let's have a short talk about entertainment tropes and women, and men. When tropes of media and entertainment, literature, film, music, and video games are discussed and dissected by media critics, the conversation usually hones in on repetitive, traditional, and at times sexist and misogynistic depictions of women, which, intentional or not, give a false impression as to how women are and how women should be treated in real life. For example, the damsel in distress to staff female superheroes based on previously male superheroes. You get the picture. Some of these tropes can limit the roles of women in art and entertainment, while not being fully realized as characters. But one question that is often brought up, either out of bettering media for women or as derision against advocacy of positive depictions of women, is if women should be treated better in art, then what about the men? You'll notice I said that last part of that question in a sort of mocking way, seeing as how some of the worst people on the internet might bring up that question to mock a slanted or misinformed view of feminism or quote 
quote unquote wokeism, even though these folks can't even define what woke means. However, as easy as it is to not take these chuckleheads seriously, there is still a discussion to be had about trying to conceive and develop healthy, more positive depictions of men that aren't stuck in traditional ways of storytelling, and to expand the scope of what it means to be a man in our ever-changing society. This is, of course, not to say, won't someone please think of misandry? Because claims of misandry can be made disingenuously to dismiss real concerns for sexism and misogyny towards women, but rather how some common depictions of men in art and entertainment are in part patriarchal, and can be detrimental to how men see themselves if they have to fall into these categories based on societal standards. For example, think of your typical male hero in video game history. Solid Snake, Master Chief, Kratos, Arthur Morgan, tall, strong, mostly white, physically fit, sometimes to the point of being unrealistically buff, like 90s comic book buff, ideally attractive, and sometimes stoic, barely speaking dialogue, if at all. Of course, most of these characters the player assumes without giving an actual voice for the character. But, pointing to this ideal portrait of what a man should look like, is less about calling out so-called misandry, so much as it's about noting that even maintaining a patriarchal society means that man can't either display characteristics which would be considered feminine, or go against this idealistic portrait of what a man should look like. Again, most of the time, when sexism gets discussed in the history of video games, especially in earlier decades, it is usually referring to the decades-long practice of objectifying women and portraying women as helpless or in need of a man to either save them and or serve for the sole purpose of being in a relationship. Complicating matters is that, for years with some improvement over the last decade, the reoccurring roles limiting the depictions of women and men also limited gender expression and sexuality beyond traditional roles and excluded gay, bi, trans, queer, and other marginalized voices. Now, while the creators of such games and characters may not be intentionally sexist or bigoted in writing these characters and are basing them off previous media, intentional or not, they have the potential to give a false impression as to how men should be or how men should view or treat women. Case in point, physical features. For men, getting active and working out is not a problem. In fact, it's pretty healthy, take it from an ex-lacrosse and football player who absolutely loves hiking, walking, running, biking, and other exercise activities outside of YouTube video essay making. However, some might say it's unrealistic for men to achieve such such a physique without doing harm to themselves both physically and mentally, and it could even be said it's patriarchal to keep depicting men this way in art and entertainment. The one popular exception to these stereotypes of men in video games is Link from The Legend of Zelda, in which despite maintaining his stoic demeanor like the silent hero of old spaghetti westerns in recent Zelda games, he has gone from just an itty bitty little 8-bit young boy to a more gender neutral depiction in the two most recent Legend of Zelda games. And despite by being shirtless in these two games, he's fit but not unrealistically buff. And as far as how games have depicted women, ahem, trying my best to give you the Cliff Notes version of this. While Princess Peach in the Super Mario Bros. series has had a significant evolution in her character, to the point of headlining her own games or being just one playable character in a title like Super Mario Bros. 2, think of earlier depictions of Princess Peach or Princess Zelda, characters who could have been fully fleshed out but relegated to having to nearly be saved, whereas for the male heroes, they have to be the almost perfect headliners. Raising concerns about trying to depict men as more flawed and grounded in realism and gaming and beyond is not so much about pulling up what about the men's counter-argument against acknowledging these problematic stereotypes of women, so much as it's asking, how do we go about improving women and men above and beyond these old, unoriginal, and at times sexist stereotypes? And why is this conversation even important? We can't ignore the games of old in gaming history as a whole, and we most certainly shouldn't be reaching for 100% realism in gaming. But even in the virtual worlds we engage in with our controllers, we can make it better through the best representation possible. And then, there's Dave from Dave the Diver. In my initial gameplay for Dave the Diver, I never thought too much about the character or his role in the village above water, as I was too caught up in getting used to the game mechanics and struggling to catch even the most basic yellow tang. And yet, day by day, I got used to seeing a portrait of a man 
pulling up his bootstraps to do all of the heavy lifting in the morning, afternoon, and evening, and giving himself time to rest when all of his work is done. All while not being an all-out superhero with unique special powers, even just to coast through his beachy, tropical life. Some might call his routine living an ideal life, maybe even perfect, at least for him. For Dave and Dave the Diver, it's getting up, eat, drink, brush your teeth, dive, eat, dive again, work your night job, then sleep and repeat the next day. Uh, you don't actually see Dave brush his teeth, I just added that. Hell, he's the kind of guy who probably wouldn't call his diving job work, even though it supports the sushi place. Of course, Dave's daily routine is up to the player to decide, and unlike Dave, in the real world, it's not always the case that we might get enough time to rest or if we consider our job to not be a job because it's our only means to get by. We real-life breathing creatures of humanity have to live such meager, average, dull lives without guaranteed health care, living wages, no paid sick time or vacation leave, at least in America, all while we are constantly bombarded and distracted by what's happening on social media and current times. Climate change, a genocide in Gaza, the ongoing COVID pandemic killing and disabling thousands, all of these real-world institutional problems distracting us from fixing our little lives. Never mind that a lot of society's problems affecting our lives can't be solved by individuals simply getting over it or finding a new hobby or a five-minute meditation, however calming it is, but massive economic and systemic change in policies, which requires radical action. As much as video games have been maligned in the past and blamed for supposedly leading to bad actions and tragedies by opportunistic politicians looking for an easy scapegoat, one reason we play video games is one which is shared with why we might read comic book superheroes, however fascistic superheroes might be, historically speaking. We need an escape from the harsh reality of our lives, and we want to feel the wish fulfillment of being a hero. It's an admittedly selfish thought when the world needs a little more altruism. And then... There is Dave the Diver, the hero of his own game, who judging from his design and perhaps in another gaming universe, would be depicted as a comic relief side character, the butt of a number of fat jokes, and someone you would hardly notice in a crowd waiting for the next train. If this game were made in another way, Cobra would be depicted as the aging action sea hero, while Dave would be the sidekick. However, the genius of Dave the Diver is that his character and arc is a subversion of the fat guy in a comedy trope. There's no fat guy fall down joke in any part of this game. There's only like one food pun while Dave is checking out the sea blue hideout. And despite appearances, Dave truly stands out from the fantastic cast of characters in the lead role, in that he does the, no pun intended, heavy lifting by moving the plot and saving the people above and underwater. Now, despite the arguments stated here, I don't think the development team behind Dave the Diver intended Dave to be more than just a fun character gamers get to play and kill some time with. And I'll admit, a lot of what I argue and say here may be overanalyzing and overthinking this cozy experience. However, intentional or not, the game's themes of perseverance, optimism, and enjoying the simple things are all what define Dave, and the fact that we never see Dave throw his hands up and give up is reminiscent of another piece of classic art. One of my favorite novels, or novellas in this case, to have skimmed and read several times is The Old Man of the Sea by American novelist Ernest Hemingway, who also wrote The Sun Also Rises and A Farewell to Arms, among other novels. The book tells the tale of the titular old Cuban fisherman named Santiago and his relentless sea quest to catch a giant marlin. And like Dave, he gets himself in some trouble with sharks. Some gamers might be wondering, wait, you ranted about Plato and Greek philosophy in a video essay about a sea diving game and now you're bringing up a book like this? As if we were in an English class? It's a video game! I came to hear about a video game! Yes, this is me being a pretentious internet asshole overanalyzing again during my overanalysis of a great game. Guilty as charged. But seriously, parallels do exist between Dave the Diver and the Old Man of the Sea beyond, well, taking place by the sea. While our game's hero Dave is younger than Santiago, both have had past experiences which are left mostly unspoken. And as Dave gets lucky while you, the gamer, play him to dive and catch plenty of fish for Bancho Sushi, Santiago starts out in the novella on a months-long unlucky streak, having not caught a fish for months. That is, until Santiago comes across the massive marlin and catches it. But his luck runs out when sharks devour the marlin, and by the end of the novella, 
but despite a rough time at sea and him arriving back, the Marlin's remains have been reduced to a mere skeleton, thanks to the sharks eating its remains. However, a slight similarity between Dave and Santiago is their outlook in life, which is shown in various parts of each work. Both the book and the game feature men who don't want to throw in the towel and give up completely, and while their luck varies, they are able to get by even with hardship. One could argue the lack of a cohesive midpoint in Dave the Diver makes the game's story weaker and the comparison falter, but I would counter by saying that this narrative choice is appropriate for Dave's character arc, seeing as how most of the hardship above and below water is felt by the other characters, especially for the people of the Sea Village, and while the game's main story ends the moment you stop Yowie to halt the earthquakes, he still persists on his diving and serving, even after he's shared a beer with the friends he's met along the way. For Dave, saving his community is just another day. However, in contrast to the almost superhuman-like video game durability of Dave the Diver, despite not exactly being a superhero, Santiago, in Hemingway's writing, is a far more realistic depiction, and while he does manage to come back ashore, Santiago has been bruised and tattered by his fishing after days being so far out at sea, at least for his age. There are several literary critics and reviewers who have drawn comparisons between the book and Christianity, mainly Jesus' suffering, though I would point out that at one point in my reading, I was thinking about parallels between Santiago's struggle and Job and the Book of Job, in particular Santiago running out of luck, keeping the marlin in one piece, and beforehand his streak of bad luck fishing, yet still he manages to hold on to the skeleton and not dispose it, almost like holding on to a trophy, or maybe even holding on to your faith. A reminder that this took a struggle through days and nights. In other words, you could say the model for both of these characters is, well, like another old timer once said, Never give up! Trust your instincts! One thing to keep in mind when reading The Old Man of the Sea is that there are a ton of well-written passages, and it's no surprise that the book is highly quotable, despite its short length, though sometimes these quotes are cited by motivational speakers out of context, leaving out Santiago's whole marlin hunt and his other inner feelings. But even out of context, Hemingway's plain English could be applied in other aspects to our lives. And so, as I was going back and skimming portions of this book, I couldn't help but highlight a few quotes, which I will read and highlight highlight how these quotes could apply to how we can see Dave, and while I don't think the game developers were inspired or even had read the book as they were making the game, I don't see why other gamers couldn't draw similar lessons between Dave the Diver and the book. I may not be as strong as I think, but I know many tricks, and I have resolution. This quote could apply to how unconventional Dave is as a leading protagonist, in that looks can be deceiving, and yet he manages to persevere. An obvious character comparison for the game is between the humble, optimistic, and jolly Dave versus the irrationally angry, morally corrupt, and muscular John Watson of Sea Blue. As gamers progress and they keep diving, they become acquainted with new ways to catch fish and learn new tricks to achieve higher star rankings for fish. There's also some speculation as to what Dave did prior to the game's offense. We know that he was already a diver prior to the game's story, as Cobra is well acquainted with Dave, but I think I read somewhere that Dave might have been military trained or maybe a spy. Maybe it was this mission where he sneaks into Sea Blue's headquarters to find out what they're really up to. Anyway, moving on. Every day is a new day. It is better to be lucky, but I would rather be exact. Then, when luck comes, you are ready. If you paid attention to my introduction chapter, I had become very fond of saying to myself and to my dog on walks since 2020, every day alive is a good day, which is a sort of variation on the first sentence of that quote while trying to get by the early months of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic up to today. Yet even if waking up to a new day in the hope that it will be better than yesterday, we still have to hope luck is on our side because luck is unpredictable, unexpected, and out of our control, and we have to get used to the unexpected, whether luck goes our way or not. And as far as getting lucky while playing the game, I can't express enough. Once again, during some of the days in the epilogue portion of Dave the Diver, how many times I got too greedy with catching all kinds of fish, seahorses, and ingredients, only to lose oxygen and lose 99% of what I caught during my dive. Sometimes this would happen two days in a freaking row, and I wouldn't have the right amount of shark meat to serve pretty expensive shark meals for nights. And then, after that hassle, how satisfying it is 
is to not mess up like the day before and have enough delicious recipes for sushi night. Or maybe I wasn't lucky enough that there weren't certain types of fish I wanted to catch in the shallows or depths, and so I had to come to the surface with a light cargo box. That last part is something I think new gamers to this game might feel. It might take some luck to learn how to catch certain fish like sharks, but like all games which force you to think about strategy, it becomes second nature. It was too good to last, he thought. I wish it had been a dream now, and that I had never hooked the fish and was alone in bed on the newspapers. But man is not made for defeat, he said. A man can be destroyed, but not defeated. The player playing Dave the Diver gets used to being defeated every once in a while from a tough boss fight which took you about three tries or more, or maybe not being careful with your stealth maneuvers which results in you getting eaten by one of those sea people zombies, aka Gadons. Yeah, this game's got mermaid zombies too. In fact, this game's got literally everything to not checking their oxygen and having to go back to the surface too early to avoid passing out, and maybe not catching enough fish, but story-wise, Dave the Diver doesn't have a lot of downer or all its lost moments in its main story. To be honest, the only time we ever see Dave and his friends feel truly defeated is when Bancho Sushi is damaged, only to get quickly repaired a few nights later. The same cannot be said for the sea people in their village, since they're a lot more directly impacted by what's going on around the glacial area and beyond. Maybe God, if he exists, made a mistake creating the divine fruit and letting those sea people toy with it and become the swimming dead? But you can't really be defeated in Dave the Diver, or for that matter, any game. Your character could be killed, get shot at, fall down a cliff, or be devoured by a shark, marlin, or mermaid zombie. Your character can be destroyed, but it's up to you if you give in to the temptation of giving up and putting the controller down. So the only thing that is going to defeat or destroy you in a video game is you. Now is no time to think of what you do not have. Think of what you can do with what there is. And this quote goes back to the broader point of playing Dave the Diver and thinking it over after many hours of gameplay and applying the game's lessons to our lives. Dave could easily make bank with his tall tales and become an overnight sensation, and in an age when we have cell phones and social media, he'd be a trending topic for months beyond the cooks the app on your phone. And yet, again, he treats this like it's just another day. We get so used to what we don't have in part due to the temptation of consumer capitalism and our impulse to buy stuff we don't need. A brand new car, even though we already have one, maybe. A jet ski we will only ride for a few weeks or months during the summertime. Buying a brand new pair of kicks, or maybe even a new game. That we don't take the time to look at what we already have right in front of us. And I should know, I'm guilty of having too many kicks in video games. Though, to be fair, at least with video games, playing any game might result in a rather lengthy video essay. You know, like the one you're watching right now. Just think of what there is in your lives. Family, friends, relatives, maybe the dog or cat lying right beside you as you're watching TV, reading a book, or appropriately, playing a video game, or in my case, writing a video essay. Humbleness and gratitude are virtues we should try to reach for, to achieve a more mindful life experience, and apply it to the hobbies we do, like playing video games, such as Dave the Diver. Have faith in the Yankees, my boy. Think of the great DiMaggio. Tell me about the baseball, the boy asked him. In the American League, it is the Yankees, as I said, the old man said happily. Sorry, those last two quotes were not related to this video. I couldn't help myself as a massive Yankee boy. But, as mentioned in discussing one of the quotes before and a joke here and there, the most striking and obvious aspect about Dave and Dave the Diver is him being a contrast from your typical leading male character in video games who have to fall into traditional ideal male standards. Mainly, uh, how do I put this? Dave is... Round? Here's the thing about body diversity in video games, and the complaints from quote-unquote real gamers about depicting diversity in video games. Since this is a topic which has reared its ugly head with the release of titles such as Stellar Blade or the upcoming Hades 2, video games may not have been the first medium to depict an ideal body image for men and or how men should look, but being a massive billion dollar industry, we see an avenue of entertainment with major AAA titles featuring men as heroes 
with bodies which could only be realized in fiction, and trying to reach or even maintain such a look for too long is unrealistic, especially as we get older and our metabolism slows down, and we don't exercise the way we do as teenagers and young adults. Trying to argue for body diversity and representation is not simply about appealing to certain demographics and trying to write off men completely, as I keep trying to emphasize. In the case of Dave the Diver, Dave being an example of great body positivity puts into perspective how trying to make an average living is, in itself, Dave's only true superpower beyond the skills and abilities you learn while diving. Dave doesn't do what he does to get the attention of another woman and show off to a potential love interest. And and he's not a show-off with an insane amount of wealth. Rather, he's more of a working-class man who just so happens to be working in a fictional setting with a very warm climate. Hell, you could say that Dave's working-class attitude and getting shit done is a throwback to the original depiction of Mario in Nintendo's 1984 Super Mario Brothers, back when he didn't have that signature Italian accent. And instead of Mario's black mustache, Dave has a black goatee. And if you look at the original Super Mario Brothers game, Mario isn't a stereotypical, physically fit hero apart from powering himself with mushrooms. Put him in Brooklyn instead of the Mushroom Kingdom, and Mario would blend right in with most ordinary folks oblivious to his adventures in the Mushroom Kingdom. And this is perhaps the perception a lot of people have who really don't know Dave or his stories under the sea. While there is no damsel for Dave to save, there is, however, a large community and a sea village which grows to love and appreciate Dave's selflessness and his tireless work. And that selfless attitude is displayed by a degree of modesty Dave has, even at the end of the game when the sea people have built a statue for him. For Dave and the player, every day is a new day. Even if you royally fuck up one day and lose oxygen, along with a lot of caught fish, you can make up for it the next day and take the temporary hit for this one bad day, and that is a lesson some of us could take from this game. This positive male character in gaming also presents a great example of gamers having a parasocial relationship with Dave in the same way as Link in the Zelda series. In both instances, while the relationship with each respective protagonist is one-sided, in that we're not directly interacting and talking with the protagonist, we relate to the character almost immediately and fill in what our hero will do based on our actions with a controller or mouse and keyboard. Sure, they both follow a linear main story, but in the two most recent Zelda titles and Dave the Diver, the player is bombarded with plenty of activities to do to fulfill the main objective requirements and then some, from the need to feel some adventure and excitement, in Dave's case being the hero of the village, and in Link's case, Hyrule. Even in the most mundane jobs, for Dave and Link that would be side quests and missions, and to finally getting that moment to relax for a bit after adventure, when, for example, Link gets to sleep on a blissful waterbed or a Rito down bed, and in Dave the Diver's case, Dave finally hitting the sack with as many stories he could make a lot of money from by publishing an epic memoir, but being too humble to commit to writing it. Also, notice how this end scene mirrors the first shot of the game? Told you I'd get back to that. Another aspect is how, despite the cast of Dave the Diver being filled with mostly men, the women in Dave the Diver are not depicted as objectified, nor are any of them trophies for Dave to achieve, either as a steam achievement or as part of Dave's character development to fulfill a love interest, with maybe the exception of saving Ramo and giving a coral porridge as potentially saving a damsel. Yoshi, no, not that one helps to recruit candidates for cooking and serving jobs at Bancho Sushi. Ellie asks Dave to help in her biological studies, which requires using the Echo Watcher phone app, and Clara seeks vengeance for the death of her husband at the hands, or in this case, jaws, of Great White Shark Claws. And as for Yoshi, while part of her character feels like she owes Bancho a favor due to an embarrassing incident in which he bungled a meal for big-time celebrity ex-actress and food critic Lewis Crawford and instead cooked one of his secret recipes, a whole roasted shark head, this is eventually made up for in a VIP meal sequence in the game in which Lois tries one of his other meals and after enjoying it, she helps to finance the second sushi place. Yoshi, like Dave, is mostly a work-focused person, sticking to recruiting for the sushi place. Pointing towards these examples of female characters doesn't mean Dave the Diver is a feminist game, nor would it be a problem if the creators intended it to be, minus the male lead. But the fact that most of the prominent female side 
side characters aren't meant to serve as a potential love interest for Dave benefits the story and is an appropriate path for his character development given what we know from playing him in the game. Dave is a job first life stuff second kind of guy, even if the job or jobs he has don't feel like he's working. It complements well with the already positive things I have to say about Dave's character, as well as the developers avoiding the temptation of forcing Dave to have a love interest. Granted, there's the fact that Ellie and Clara need the assistance of a man to do her science work for the former and to kill Claus for the latter. And yeah, also Duff and his obsession with the girls of the fictional Straw Stella and the mobile game you play, which depicts Duff asleep and dreaming away. And while you could say this plays on sexism, this is mostly play for laughs at the expense of Duff, so there's that. Lee Jones. So, in short, Dave the Diver's main character is a prime example of featuring great body positive representation, showing that despite his unconventional body for a lead in an adventure video game and presumed obesity going against male body standards and media, Dave is able to be his own hero under the sea, as well as handle the stress of managing a restaurant, all while celebrating body diversity and not shouting out loud about it. Sure, there's a fat joke thrown in here and there, but at least they are kept to a minimum, and don't cloud the theory as to whether or not Dave's unspoken background prior to the game's events was a little more covert, if you will. Hell, speaking of which, Dave is also a pretty decent spy if you somehow manage to sneak through Sea Blue's hideout, which could suggest Dave's background was in the military, which might explain his relationship with Cobra and why he sells a lot of gadgets and bombs. See, also, sneaking behind Bancho Sushi's number one cat, Momo, and finding out what the game's signature black and white cat is up to. Forgot to mention that I absolutely dig the music to that little sequence as well. It reminds me a lot of old school MS-DOS games. However, as much as I like to sing the praises for this absolute guilty pleasure of a game, if we're gonna be even-handed with how we feel about any piece of art like a video game, yep, you know what time it is. Alright, so I had mentioned earlier in this essay that Dave the Diver is arguably one of the most conservative games I've played in a while, at least in the sense of being physically conservative when managing a restaurant, which is not a complete diss of the overall product so much as it's an observation based on playing it. As somebody who leans pretty far on the left side of the political spectrum, I don't think art made from a conservative perspective is inherently bad, even with its problematic elements and one should be open to observing and or taking part in art which might challenge you. I mean, to use an obvious example in popular cinema, if we were to outright dismiss conservative art, then I would think the original Ghostbusters was kinda bad. And of course, some gamers are going to disagree that it leads right when it comes to the money management. It's just how I read the game and how Dave manages to persevere through unrealistically overworking himself. Basically, he's working two jobs with the diving and restaurant management serving, and also the fish and autos farms, which makes it three or four more jobs he's gotta do all in a day to keep the sushi place afloat. But more explicitly, taking this as a politically conservative game even further, how it has an extreme stereotype of an animal rights slash eco-activist like John Watson, one of the mini bosses in the game and the head of Sea Blue, and yes, in the literal sense of being mini since he's not a kaiju, and who is portrayed as an extremely buff guy in contrast to Dave, but also hypocritical in how he actively damages the underwater environment while shouting at Dave for killing fish to help keep the sushi place afloat, with only a slight mention as to how large corporations are bigger polluters of water, and more broadly, the environment. Though I can't help but laugh at Watson getting an unusually cruel presumed death towards the end of the game. Not that it's a requirement to be a great or even fun game, nor do I expect it to be as nuanced or sympathetic as a piece of cinematic art like the 2022 film, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, but Dave the Diver not only is reluctant to engage in the broader problem of climate change, change and damage to the environment and only deals with environmental damage on an individual level. But since this game has you killing and cooking fish, which is what is thought to be motivating Sea Blue to go after Dave, the game doesn't engage in the ethics of veganism or even vegetarianism, despite at least from where I sit, there being no ethical argument whatsoever to justify the practice of eating food made from animals. Yes, that does include fish. Hell, even meat and fish eaters have to concede that when they admit they can't simply 
simply stop eating meat, that they're just appealing to how good the food tastes, an emotional argument to justify their meat eating. Of course, since gaming deals with virtual worlds, I don't feel guilty about going from gliding to shooting arrows in bullet time in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom because whatever morals I might have in real life, I know games are fiction and they're not real. And it's the exact same feeling when I harpoon a few sharks in the depths. Also, and perhaps this is me walking on eggshells, but I looked up the translation for the name Bancho, and one of the definitions for the name refers to the leader of a gang of Japanese juvenile delinquents. Now, putting aside that the term has also been used as a nickname for baseball players in Japan, me being a little knowledgeable about baseball, yes, the sport's pretty big in Japan, I am not saying Dave the Diver is problematic or racist, or that the development team needs to be cancelled for this potential blunder I just happened to notice while looking up stuff for this video. But it does feel, at the very least, weird and off-putting that one of the few non-white characters in a relatively pleasant and safe game like Dave the Diver shares a name with a term used to describe a gang leader, when there's nothing in Bancho's character description, dialogue, or cutscenes to suggest a criminal past, or that he's okay with crime. Again, the only thing unique about Bancho is with his practice as head chef, in that he's always wanting to learn new dishes and the one time he does get emotional with Dave is with his taste for sushi, which takes place pretty early in the game and long before Dave has done the work of managing the restaurant. Again, the game is pretty sensitive not to hone in too many fat jokes at the expense of its main character, so it's bizarre that it couldn't do the same for its one lone prominently black male character. Putting aside the rather lengthy gameplay to get to the cover 100% completion mark if or if not you're following the Steam achievements section, hey, at least it's not 112%. As you can tell from my gameplay footage, and maybe I should apologize for this being a minor distraction for viewers, I mostly relied on my mouse and keyboard to beat the game, which is not the most ideal format for playing games like this, especially if you're like me, I use multiple monitors to edit my videos and to capture game footage. Despite this game being a controller preferred experience, mouse and keyboard is a manageable way to play this game, except for when the mouse goes off screen by mistake and a shark pokes me before trying to go for a bite. And this is especially bad if you're running low on oxygen. Oh, and uh, there's also the watermark in the bottom right corner while playing this game which displays the game's build menu. From what I have read, there's no way to remove it in the display settings, at least if you're like me and you're playing this on your MacBook through Steam. But again, this is manageable. I can understand keeping gamers informed on what version they are playing when loading up a save file, but for the love of god, sometimes it is annoying that there's no option to remove it on the Mac version while playing, and it just hangs there like a sore thumb. It's like the giant orange and sometimes green dot at the top right of your display if you're playing games on a Mac and are capturing footage on OBS. Uh, as an update to this section, while I finished writing this part of the script, I started playing a good portion of Dave the Diver with an LG ultra wide screen which will display games at 3440 times 1440 so the orange dot is no longer an issue since I could crop it while editing on Premiere, but not so much if I were playing it with a MacBook only. And of course, there's this. Let's keep this section as short as possible. Despite the sweet pixelated artwork combined with a fantastic soundtrack and some impressive gameplay, and just plain old heart and soul distinguishing itself from major AAA titles released last year and giving the appearance of a recently released indie game in the vein of Celeste and Fez, the reality is Dave the Diver is technically not an indie game, and this is something the creative team admitted themselves. In case anyone wasn't aware, there was a bit of a controversy last year when the Game Awards announced their nominations, and in the category for Best Independent Game, sat Dave the Diver as a nominee alongside Cocoon, Dredge, Viewfinder, and Sea of Stars, with the latter being the eventual winner. And Dave the Diver's nomination would not have been a problem were it not for the fact that Midrocket, the gaming company responsible for developing and publishing Dave the Diver, is itself not an indie gaming company, but a subsidiary of major South Korean video game company Nexon 
Pokemon. While there's no doubt the Game Awards have had plenty of issues and controversies in the past, the reason that this nomination was a problem was because this came at the expense of other worthwhile indie games, which did not have the financial backing of a major corporation supporting them. And the worst part about discussing this is that it seems the biggest names in gaming will either be silent about this issue, or be cool with an issue like this happening again. During a Twitch Q&A session, according to this Kotaku article, Jeff Keighley said the following with regard to the game's nomination and the debate surrounding it. Quote, Look, it's a great question. Independent can mean different things to different people, and it's sort of a broad term, right? I mean, you could argue, does independent mean the budget of the game? Does independent mean where the source of financing was? Is it based on the team's size? Is it the kind of independent spirit of a game, meaning kind of a smaller game that's different? Everyone has their own opinion about this, and we really defer to our jury, 120 global media outlets that vote on these awards to kind of make that determination of is something independent or not. You know, in other industries, sometimes there are determining factors. I think in the film industry, there's like, the budget can't be above this amount of dollars if it's an independent film. End of quote. While this is certainly the sort of statement that would piss off hardworking indie devs, this is probably not the worst thing Keeley said or did in recent memory. That would be that slight poke at people awaiting that certain Metroidvania game sequel during the awards, and also his absolute silence on game employees getting fired by Microsoft and Sony earlier this year. And this is more evidence that when it comes to highlighting the gaming industry's biggest accomplishments, perhaps Jeff Keeley is not the right person to be spokesperson. Now, do I think Dave the Diver is an indie game or deserves to be put in the indie genre? Well, based upon what I've read from articles and think pieces and angry Reddit comments and tweets, and more importantly, the production story behind the game, no. But to be frank, and after giving this subject much thought, unless we're talking about something as meaningful for indie developers as award shows, because winning accolades could mean potential career advancement. For the gamer who doesn't think too much about these things, I don't think it matters whether or not Dave the Diver qualifies as an indie game, at least in the sense that this controversy doesn't address the positive qualities that the game delivers. Of course, if I were part of a voting committee deciding nominees for best indie game, I would have to give a hard no to nominating this game based on the financial backing and to use my platform to encourage the need to elevate the games, which get glossed over and hardly get promotion in comparison to major AAA titles, and or get buried on Steam. And this whole controversy at the Game Awards could have been avoided by advocating for other worthy indie games which didn't have a parent company for a little extra funding. Like, why in the hell wasn't American Arcadia nominated in this category? Or even better, nominate Dave the Diver for Game of the Year. At the very least, it's still getting publicity and recognition, but mostly, I blame the people coming up with these awards and setting themselves up for online outrage, however righteous it might be. It's bad enough that we're close to the 10 year anniversary of one of video games most toxic events in history and even now as certain uh true gamers harp about wokeism and gaming without even defining what woke even means apart from art and entertainment not featuring prominently white male characters but in dark corners of the internet indie gaming and the developers behind indie games are often mocked scorned and at times harassed on the internet despite the overwhelming amount of fantastic indie games released over the last decade or so which go beyond the norms, AAA games revisit again and again, and challenge us both as gamers and as humans on an individual and societal level. To meeting indie games and indie developers, or even neglecting to acknowledge their work, devalues the very time and labor they pour into their work. From indie games which have gone to become major names even casual gamers know who don't typically pay attention to industry news and happenings like Minecraft, Starview Valley, and especially Hollow Knight, to well-crafted stories like Firewatch and What Remains of Edith Finch, and by the way, if it wasn't for indie game development, gamers wouldn't have that franchise featuring walking and jump-scaring animatronics almost entirely made by one very, very, very Trumpy kind of guy. <laughs> especially considering that the Kickstarter for the first game got zero dollars in funding. Regardless, this discussion of the indie game industry, the creation and business aspects of making indie games, and unfortunately, the toxic aspects of and hostility towards indie gaming and the developers and journalists involved in creating and covering indie games is a subject which I have been deeply invested in for at least a decade, and I could go on about this subject, especially considering some recent unfortunate events which have 
have happened to gaming journalists and developers, but I think it's best to save this for another time. So let's wrap this up with a nice little bow. Whew. I have said before elsewhere that sometimes objectivity in art criticism is not always possible, and this is especially true for myself when I set out to write and critique pieces of art and entertainment, including video games. Perhaps it might be a case of recency bias which drives me to have the critique and opinion I have presented here in this video essay, or maybe it's being unable to let go of my childhood nostalgia, longing to go back to a rosebud moment in my life, case in point my Star Fox 64 video essay from last Christmas Eve, which proved that I cannot be 100% objective in my critique of gaming. And while other games might make the case for your personal game of the year in 2023 like American Arcadia, Super Mario Bros. Wonder, or The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, when I take a step back and observe the words I have written, I can't help but admit it, even without having the need to write it, I absolutely love Dave the Diver and how it stood out from other video games released in 2023. I love the humor, the cast of characters, the cutscenes, the soundtrack, the references to other video games and nods to other media, the kaiju monster fights underwater, and some of the most heartfelt moments in between all of the action and comedy that feels so earned. In another universe, this game would have been disposable, but after playing it for myself for 30 hours, and then some more hours afterwards, I got more joy out of this game than any other title I could think of. And most importantly, this game game is a reminder that, no matter what you're going through, it's the simple things in life, food, drink, and friends, that make every day alive a good day. Thank you all so much for taking the time to sit down and watch this one. This video essay in particular was a lot of fun to look back on and to discuss what I really enjoyed about this game because at first I didn't think I would have a lot to say when I thought about writing a script for this Dave the Diver essay and so I thought my analysis of the game would be better suited for a brief community post on my YouTube page. No video needed, but then like always it morphed into a project which thankfully got bigger and which I can work with and record voiceover and so on. Of course given the length it takes to beat the base game, I had to sort out through 30 hours of gameplay, labeling each video of captured footage and trying to condense all of it into one project, and then play a little bit more of it just for fun because I dug this game so much. Anyway, this is the part of the video where I tell you that if you enjoyed this video essay, please like, comment, and share elsewhere on social media. If you want to support the work I do even further, please consider subscribing to the Armchair Brain YouTube channel by pressing the subscribe button and ring the bell as well to get notified when new video essays premiere, and make sure to follow me and my Twitch page, Blue Sky, and my new TikTok page to keep up with me on social media outside of YouTube. Coming up, we have a ton of projects planned for the not-too-distant future, mostly on video games, but I do want to branch out into literature, film, and music, and hopefully we can get to that as 2024 rolls along. The big Hollow Knight video essay is one that I've been planning since last year, and which I will have a script ready for voiceover at the end of August, since I will be working on the script in June and July. My essays on Tears of the Kingdom and What Remains of Edith Finch are still planned for 2024. I think some people might be getting the impression that I dislike or even hate Tears of the Kingdom, and I am here to tell you no, I actually dig it. But you're gonna have to wait for my full thoughts a few months from now. Maybe. And of course, there's the big summer project, which I have been working on at the moment, trying to clean up the script and footage, and this will be the main project I will be focusing on for the rest of spring up to the midpoint of summer, with a premiere date planned for early August, assuming nothing dramatic happens in between between now and the middle of summer. But I gotta tell you, uh, there's really nothing to worry about. Um, I'll be fine. So, I think some of you have deduced what this project is going to be about, judging from the teaser at the end of the OG Legend of Zelda video essay from last March and from my community page. Anyway, thanks very much again, hope your day is swell, and I'll see you in the next one. Ha 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 